we go. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to Simons Electron Microscopy Center's Winter EM course. Today we are moving towards the end of our new frontiers and EM challenges. And today's topic sort of covers both. And that a few years ago we used to be at what we consider moderate resolution. Right now, based upon what you heard from Tom and Kathy, it is more common that through direct methods you have a better idea of what your resolution is. However, resolution is not one number, and though your core might be high in atomic or near atomic, your periphery or regions of high conformational flexibility might be more moderate. And how do you interpret that? Today, our lecturers are going to be two lecturers, that's both Gira and Damien, and they're going to be talking about moderate resolution interpretation, and that's what they do day in, day out. They work on uh, cellular motility and transport, and a lot of that, when you have conformational dynamics and flexibility, you're really now moving beyond your reconstruction, you're trying to interpret biology. And that's really important to really match understanding the biology with the raw data you have and what you're trying to experiment with. And so the moderate resolution is an intermediate range where we have yet to define. So that's why we call it a challenge and really trying to answer biology in whatever regime we are in. So I'll turn it over to both Damien and Garrett. Okay. All right, um, well, we can get started. So Gear and I will be tag teaming and kind of switching back and forth uh, for the different sections here. Um, so, all right. Um, yeah, so, so everyone, of course, is very excited about these really high resolution structures that are starting to come out of cryo-EM. But I think it's worth noting that, you know, we still, we still are depositing a lot of maps at kind of intermediate and low resolution. And so this is the data from the maps deposited um, in 2018. So you can see that of the 1,700, 1,800 maps deposited, um, only, only a subset are really falling in this kind of near atomic resolution range, um, whereas the vast majority are still kind of in the five angstroms plus resolution. And so um, while, while this is what's driven really kind of a lot of the excitement about EM over the last few years, um, we're still trying to uh, extract biologically useful information from these lower resolution data sets as well. And so today um, we'll talk a bit about kind of both ends of this spectrum. So, so what, what we can potentially learn from data sets that are in the kind of say maybe like eight to 15 angstroms resolution range and some of the things we can learn as we start to approach this kind of near atomic regime. Okay, so, um, so this is what an, an atomic resolution map looks like. And so really what that means is that when we contour this map down, we have a bit of density that corresponds to the position of, of each atom. And so in this regime, we can start to actually rely entirely on our electron density map to determine the position of, of essentially each atom in our protein. Um, but more often when people are talking about near atomic resolution, they're talking about a map that looks something a bit more like this. So. Um, Secondary structure elements may be reasonably well defined. We may see some density for side chains, but it doesn't always very clearly establish where those side chains are. Um, and so deciding what rotomer, for example, might, might be a bit, bit challenging for, for some of the resonance you see here. Um, and quite often, we're dealing with maps that are even lower resolution. Um, and so you know, in, in this sort of resolution range, um, even, even being able to separate secondary structure features um, often can be quite difficult. So as we contour this down, we can see uh, at this kind of like eight to 10 angstroms resolution, we, can, we can't even always reliably separate out the helices. Quick question. Sure. What were those three maps of that you just showed us? Uh, okay, so the, the first map was, um, so the, the, I'm not showing all EM maps actually, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the first one um, was from, I want to say it was from Barnes, um, or some, it was something solved in the vicinity of maybe like 0.9 angstroms resolution. The second one was a kind of 4.2 angstrom map from a recent structure of the LPS transporter. Um, and the final one was um, from uh, F1 ATPase or, or uh, I forget if it was F1 or one of the kind of related, so, so something that kind of like proton driven ATPase. Um, and so, so really the, the big question we're focused on today is, is trying, to, trying to interpret this lower resolution cryo EM density maps um, to extract meaningful information uh, to answer important questions in biology. Okay, and so, so I think um, what's important to appreciate I think fairly straight away is that showing you those, those um, density maps I just showed you that, that 
the map is generally not going to be sufficient to really determine the position of individual atoms. Um, and so we rely heavily on, on some sort of prior knowledge um, to, to help guide our, um, our structure determination. And so you can imagine, so in the extreme, like that first map I showed you in the atomic resolution regime, you can rely almost entirely on your, your, uh, your data, your, your density map. Um, and you could potentially, uh, in extreme cases where you are, say, better than one extreme resolution, you could let go of any sort of other knowledge almost entirely and rely entirely on your map. On the other extreme, uh, at lo very low resolution, the map tells you actually very little, apart from maybe being able to place domains or the overall envelope of your molecule, um, will rely almost entirely on some sort of prior knowledge, so knowledge of folds, knowledge of, of um, secondary structure. And in the uh, intermediate regime, which is where we live most of the time, uh, we're using some kind of combination of the two. And it's kind of a sliding scale. As you get to higher resolution, you may rely less heavily on this prior knowledge. Uh, and at lower resolution, we rely on it quite, quite heavily. Okay, and so what are these kinds of prior knowledge? Um, so we'll kind of start from, from uh, molecular scale and, and move up a bit. So, so, um, so, so um, knowledge of kind of secondary structure and what molecules look like is a major component of this. So you know, from, from high resolution structures of, of say small molecules, we, we know a lot about say what carbon-carbon what -carbon bond lengths should look like or carbon-nitrogen bond lengths what the angles should be between, between, um, between these bonds, and, um, and what the torsion angles should be around, around rotatable bonds. All right? And so we can constrain our model based upon what we know molecules should look like. And so just to give you kind of an example of this in the context of a protein, so we all know, you know what a phenylalanine residue should look like. And we know that, that, say, for example, this ring structure should be planar, and each of these angles should be, say, about uh, 60 degrees. Um, and so when we look at uh, a kind of moderate resolution electron density map, however, you can see that we're not really defining what this ring should look like in this map. And so if we were to refine this in essentially completely unrestrained way, what you'll see is that the residue basically just collapses. So all the residue, all the atoms of the residue are pushed into the kind of the minimum of, of the density map. And so we need, to, we need to apply whatever restraints to keep phenylalanines looking like phenylalanines, but at the same time allowing them to kind of relax into, into our density maps. Um, one step up from this, so we, we know that proteins are generally made of, of secondary structural elements, so alpha helices and beta sheets. And so when we, when we start trying to fit proteins in the map and to refine them, we know that we need to maintain the correct hydrogen bonding to, to maintain beta strands uh, in their sheets to maintain the conformation of alpha helices. And so similarly, when we're looking at even a pretty decent looking map where this helix um, is, is reasonably well defined by the density, you can see that again, if we, if we try to refine this without, oops, sorry, I guess I have to let that movie play the rest of the way. Yeah, so if we, if we um, try to, to refine this helix and, and fit it into the map without applying sufficient restraints, you'll see that, that all of the atoms of the helix, again, just kind of collapse into, the, into their local minimum. And so we need to apply some sort of restraints to keep things that are helices looking helical and beta strands looking like beta strands. Taking one step further up, so many structures have been solved of, of various protein domains. So there's a relatively limited number of, of protein folds thought to exist, something on the order of a few thousand, maybe, maybe 3,000 or so. And most of these have probably already been solved. Um, you know, every year there's, there's uh, a few new um, folds that are determined, but by and large, probably most of these have been solved. And so looking at your favorite protein, it's very likely that it is that it's composed of one or more of these known domains. All right, so you don't have to start your structure determination from scratch. You can probably actually start from, from one of these known domains and start fitting these into your map. And so this, this process, um, using known domains as a source of prior information, certainly accelerates the model building process and makes it much easier to assign the connectivity between secondary structure at these kind of modest resolutions. How sure. related to the, uh, how, yeah, how related does, uh, does it have to be you know, to your protein of interest and uh, domains that are? Yeah, um, I'd say, you know, as a starting point, I mean, you, you probably want to, based on your sequence, be reasonably confident that you know that, that particular region of your protein adopts a particular fold. But it, you know, it could. I, 
think, be quite distant to be useful. So it's, um, it's more relaxed than, for example, molecular replacement? I think it could be much like much more relaxed because as long as you, you know, so, so as you start going to fit this into the map, I mean, using some kind of automated tool, perhaps it will work better um, the closer your, you know, the domain you pull out of the PDB is to your target structure. But I think your eye is pretty good at being able to, to kind of manually fit something in. And so if you can get it into about the right place, sure, you'll have to maybe relax. Maybe, maybe a helix will only be half in the density, but you can see it's in about the right, right position and you can kind of, um, it gives you a starting point. And in particular, I think with these connections, you know, so you can imagine if you had all the secondary structure in there, sometimes making these connections between helices could be difficult. But this this domain that you fit in actually tells you, okay, helix one connects to helix two uh, at the top side, not at the bottom side. Okay. okay. And the final final bit of kind of prior structural information is quaternary structure. And so this doesn't necessarily apply in all cases, but in many situations, we know that. Um, that a particular protein, like multiple domains, assemble in a particular overall structure. And so the example here I'm giving you is a, a fab fragment from an antibody, which are very popular kind of uh, chaperone reagents, both in crystallography and, and uh, for use as fiducial markers in EM. Um, and so this uh, fab fragment is made up of four of these IG domains here in these different colors. However, they always assemble in this kind of stereotypical way. Um, and so you have two variable domains that kind of tightly associate and two constant domains that are tightly associated. And while there might be a little bit of flexibility here across this, this elbow, um, by and large, fabs kind of always look roughly the same. And so if you were working on a structure that contained a fab fragment, you don't necessarily have to try to find each of these IG domains individually, but you can take an entire fab molecule and start to fit it into your, your density map. And so even at the level of 2D class averages, some of these quaternary structures become quite apparent. And so, so here, um, there are actually three fabs uh, bound to a central antigen in this case. But here you can see a fab that's oriented essentially in this, in this view here. And they have these kind of characteristic kind of dimples in the center of, of, kind of two, two other domains. OK, and then the final bit of prior information we can draw on comes from biochemistry and kind of bioinformatic analyses. And so um, we can get a lot of information about potential domain-domain interactions and residues that are in close proximity to each other from a variety of sources. And so some of these can be from things like um, yeast 2 hybrid experiments or co-IP experiments where we can tell that domain A is physically interacting with domain B. Um, Cross-linking experiments that can give us kind of higher resolution, residue-specific information about which pairs of residues are potentially in close proximity to each other. Um, and even uh, bioinformatic analyses that can allow the identification of co-evolving pairs of residues based upon just pure sequence data. And so all of these kind of provide constraints that allow you to know what parts um, within, a, say, folded domain might be close together if you're not starting from a domain of known structure, and what uh, parts of different domains might be in close proximity to each other forming protein-protein interactions. Um, and so all of this can be used to either guide the early modeling stages to maybe perhaps help you place domains in your density map in the first place, or later on uh, to validate um, how well you've done in modeling your, your map. Okay, so um, there'll be kind of three main parts of, uh, of this lecture today. Um, and so Gira will start us off at kind of fairly low resolution and we'll move up to kind of intermediate and, and um, perhaps near atomic, okay. ju just below near atomic, uh, kind of towards yeah. the end. Thanks, I guess it depends on your definition of moderate and high and all of this. But um, yeah, I think we kind of wanted to go through the scales just because even though the whole um, the revolution is about high resolution, I think we can actually get a lot of biological information at, at many different resolutions. Um, so actually, I'm going to walk us through first um, a paper here from uh, Ian McRae's lab of scripts, which actually is at low resolution. So it's actually all negative stain data. But um, I think even at that level, um, we actually got, he, they could get some really insightful information from this. So we'll walk through it. Um, so we're going to look at, he, they were looking at this enzyme here in Dysel. Um, the job of the enzyme is to take uh, RNA and chop it up into very discrete sized pieces, 21 to 23 nucleotides or so. 
So we have a big enzyme, there's lots of different discrete domains, and the prior information here was uh, crystal structures of several domains, but it's really not, it was not understood um, how these domains are oriented relative to each other, and so that's what they s went to figure out. And so when they made this protein and looked at just negative stain reconstruction, you can see um, really pretty low resolution, but you see some features, right? And so the question here is kind of what goes where? Can any domains be reliably fit into this map? And so at this resolution, you could, um, you know, you could pretty much take any of the, those domains and put them anywhere you like and arrive at something which would probably not be meaningful. Um, but I think they actually did something uh, pretty cool and uh, I think it's a very useful strategy where they could put a specific tag on each of these domains individually. So for example, here they have um, an AVI tag which will allow you to specifically biotinylate only that region. Because of the information from the crystal structures, they could take a pretty good guess as to where they could actually put that tag. And then they could incubate it with monovalence tryptavidin, and this would give them sort of a site-specific tag at that location to identify where is that domain. And so you would end up with a construct that then would be exclusively tagged on this particular domain. You could do it for any domain of your choice where you actually have that prior knowledge of, well, where can I put a tag that would be tolerable? And so kind of doing this, um, I think they got a pretty, pretty decent idea of where these different domains are. So here we're looking at three of the different domains, um, the density shown in a couple of different views. And so when they label uh, this PAS domain, you can see that the streptavidin density shows up there. When they label the platform domain, it kind of shows up on the other side. Um, and the RNAs3 label shows up in the middle. And so even at this kind of um, pretty low resolution, I think they could make uh, biologically meaningful conclusion of how these domains are oriented uh, relative to, to each other. And so this allowed them to go ahead and place, um, place these different domains where they were most likely located. And this actually uh, gave them a couple of in different insights. One is that the human dicer is actually different to previously uh, characterized dicer from Giardia. Um, other insights were exactly how the spacing might help this enzyme to cut RNA specifically in 21 to 23 nucleotides uh, pieces. And so, um, so I think that depending on your biological question, you may actually get a really leap uh, forward in your biological insight uh, regardless of what resolution you're at. And so I think kind of keeping in mind different strategies to use, different kinds of prior knowledge that can help you generate a more clear biological picture is sort of the key thing. And so I specifically chose this kind of negative stain data uh, just to indicate that it's not, it's not always necessary that you're gonna have to be at three angstroms to really provide in biological insight. Um, and I'm sure if this was done in 2012, and I'm sure they can get um, really beautiful data now, and I, I also really like high resolution data, but, um, but just to keep in mind the different things that you can get out depending on your question. So that's like 20 to 30 inches? I would guess. I, I don't even think I would hedge my bets on <laughs> what resolution. Yeah, in your pie chart, is it that there was, there was 3% that was over 60? <laughs> I mean, people can deposit, I mean, the PDB and EMDB are not really um, moderated in any way, so you could deposit anything you like. They could be including, I don't really know if that may also include some uh, tomographic data oh, yeah, and so other stuff. Yeah, yeah. So like it could be tomography data. Um, yeah, yeah, I would guess some, some, maybe it's more towards, I'm guessing actually in the next, 10 years, we're going to see a lot more structural cell biology stuff deposited, mm -hmm. and that's going to be at lower resolution, but might actually provide a huge amount of insight into the biology. So, um, Okay, so that was that little story. Uh, and the next one that I'm going to walk you through uh, is about um, motor protein called dynein. Um, that's a work from, from our own lab. Um, and in this case, so I just showed you about actually looking at how different domains are arranged in a low resolution map. Um, in this case, we were interested in kind of how do at the domain, subdomain level, maybe at some secondary structure level, how do conformational changes actually um, work in this protein and give us some insight into it. 
Um, and I won't go. I won't really go into the biology. Uh, in a nutshell, the protein walks along microtubules and carries stuff wherever it goes. And one of the goals was to understand the mechanism of how it does this, and it's an ATPase. Um, so just what I will do is introduce you to AAA ATPases because we're going to play around with the subdomains here in order to fit them into the density. So your typical AAA ATPase is a ring-shaped thing like this. And each domain has a AAA large domain and then a AAA small domain. And six uh, identical monomers usually come together to make this hexamer. And then in between that small and large domain is where ATP binds. And then um, you would have some kind of conformational change that would lead to function. Uh, here I'm just showing you an example of clip X, uh, which is a bacterial protease. But if we look at this protein dynein, it's a little bit unique in that it has six different uh, AAA domains that come together, so it's, it's asymmetric. Um, also has some appendages that come off it, and uh, another domain that kind of sits on top, so it's kind of a modified version of your typical AAA ATPase. Um, and then it's even bigger, but we really are only concerned with this part shown in, um, in multicolors. And we are going to specifically focus on this region for the purpose of fitting into these maps. So it's also very uh, conformationally heterogeneous, which partly was our interest. So just to compare um, different kinds of samples, right? You can have ribosomes, which are super nice and pretty. Um, this is something else we work on, where the still particles are still kind of nice and easy to see. And then these are your uh, dynein AAA um, motor domain particles. So, you know, they're kind of flexible, they're smallish, they uh, are not your ideal, you know, you wouldn't say like, I, I really want to learn cryo-EM, let's, let's work on this. Um, so, on the other hand, the reason we were working on it was to explore that conformational heterogeneity. Um, okay, so here's a typical reconstruction you can get of this dynein motor domain. And so right now it looks a little bit of a mess. Um, I'm going to fit in the, a crystal structure to kind of just indicate the different things that we can see. So if you look in these areas, you can sort of see that helices are defined kind of okay. Same maybe around here or around there. Um, in other regions, like here, you really have not much definition except at the domain level. So maybe we can say the yellow domain, because we know the whole thing is a, a one peptide, one polypeptide, we know that the yellow domain might fit here and the green domain might fit there, but we don't really know that much. But if we go back to um, what I told you about these, each of those domains is made up of one large, one large domain, one small domain. And so at that resolution, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing any kind of secondary structure fitting because depending on where you are in the molecule, you may see secondary structure, you really may not, depends if you're in a helical area of beta sheet. But what I would feel pretty comfortable doing is to separate each large domain and small domain and then fit these simultaneously into the density to look at at subdomain movements. So in this case, we consider each large domain and each small domain as a rigid body. And we're asking what are the changes between those rigid bodies. Um, and so this you can do in Chimera. And so you can basically take your, if you have, you know, so you have six domains here, so you have 12 rigid bodies and then fit those 12 rigid bodies simultaneously uh, into your density and get a sense of how the subdomains rotate. And so initially, um, we were able to do this with, um, you know, uh, with a couple of different structures in different nucleotide-bound states. And so, at the at the domain level, um, we could actually see different conformational changes in this protein in response to adding different nucleotides um, into this AAA ring. So. Um, Okay, so, so we can take that a little further. And now we have a mutant that we want to compare with the wild type protein. And so in this case, this particular mutant actually had two classes. So we could do the same things we would do at high resolution. We could do 3D classification. We could get different, different models. And so I'm showing you here two different classes coming out of the same um, data set. And I'm also coloring it by resolution, so you can see it ranges between some, somewhere, say, 7-ish to 10-ish, something like this. 
Um, and so what could we get out of these data? So we, uh, you know, the key thing here was really to firstly convince yourself that they are actually two different classes, which I think is not always trivial. Um, but I think looking at different features of the density in different regions would maybe convince you of that. So for example, this region is very well defined here and it's completely missing there. And, and uh, you, we could then see other kind of conformational changes here. I'm just showing examples of what the density looked like in, in better areas and also in worse areas. Um, and so I think really inspecting, uh, manually inspecting the features of the density in the local area that you want to interpret and you want to make a conclusion from is really key. Um, in this case, we had a ligand bound, but of course we're not going to see any hint of the ligand that's sort of 7 to 10 angstroms, right? So using uh, biochemistry and functional assays, actually with the same protein, with the same protein prep that you're doing the structure with, to confirm um, that in that condition your protein actually binds the ligand as you think it does, uh, was, was kind of a key piece of this. And um, also trying a few different classification strategies, um, which we like to then see converge on the same two classes if that's what we're really going to interpret, and not that we kind of do it one way and get one result, do something else and <laughs> get another result. So we usually try a few different strategies of classification to really um, come, come to that conclusion. And so here um, you can kind of see one could try to do a little bit of more flexible fitting with. Uh, with the helices that are clearly visible. And uh, you know, so sometimes we will do this in Phoenix as well, but unless it's really well defined, where let's say a helix becomes kinked and you can clearly account for the extra density you see and moving it into that kinked position, I would say at this kind of resolution, uh, I think interpreting it as sort of subdomain movements are probably uh, the, the uh, most appropriate thing to do. And so, what could we get out of this? We could then model these sort of subdomain movements as we saw. So you can see in this case, we could model these little two uh, hairpins as well, which we couldn't do in the other one. Um, we had two classes out of them. We could see how these, this class is different from that class. So here we've just plotted vectors between the C alpha of each um, of those. And so you can see on this side of the ring, there's much less movement. On that side of the ring, there's much more movement. And because we could place the subdomains, we could see that in this orange one specifically um, was where a lot of that change was coming from because we actually had a large gap open up between the um, two domains here. Okay, and so then, uh, then we could go ahead and make actually some comparisons between uh, the wild type and the mutant, and um, what we could, you know, we could say align it on the cyan domain, for example, and you'll see that some of the movements between the wild type and the mutant are largely conserved on one half of the ring. It seems actually there's not much difference, um, whereas on the other half of the ring, uh, you actually disturb these conformational changes, which for us was biologically meaningful because we could put it back in the context of the biology and in the context of all of our other experiments, which included um, signal molecule light microscopy, uh, ATPase assays, and so on and so forth, to make kind of a meaningful conclusion from this. Um, so, yeah, so I think at these resolutions, you can actually get reasonably decent information depending on your question. Um, and I think we could actually, in this case, have much nicer insights at much higher resolution as well. Um, but that would be, those would be answering different questions, I think. Okay, so now we'll go back to the sort of entire, higher scale of the intermediate resolution. Okay, so as you start getting beyond this uh, domain level resolution, um, so we want to talk about what maps look like and, and what we can make out of them. Um, and the really key thing, I guess, to keep in mind at this point is that, you know, when you look at a particular protein fold, the vast majority of it is made up of secondary structure elements, right? So alpha helices, beta strands. And so if you can find these in the map, then you're off to the races in terms of building building your new structure, right? But but at what what do these look like at varying resolutions, and how can we start to, to pick them out? 
Um, and so I want to walk through um, some maps that at a range of different resolutions here. So I showed you this, this video a little bit earlier. Um, so this is at about eight and a half angstroms resolution. And so of course, depending upon where you are in the map and, and the overall quality, you know, so just because you're at eight angstroms, uh, you might look at good areas of your map and bad areas of your map and you may resolve different things. But, but as you're above eight angstroms resolution, quite often you'll be unable to resolve um, alpha helices. But something kind of magical happens in the vicinity of eight angstroms resolution. Um, and so here's a map at, at seven and a half. And so as we contour down, you can see you start to be able to actually separate these alpha helices. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so here we can then, you can imagine if this was your map and you had nothing in here, you might be able to start docking alpha helices into the map and, and starting to, to piece together something. Um, as you move to higher resolution, it takes a while before you can see much more than this. So here's another map at about six angstrom resolution. Um, you can see that again, you can pretty clearly separate these alpha helices, um, but that's about it. You, you don't really get a sense of, of where side chains are or the handedness of the helix, which um, we'll come to in a minute in terms of determining the handedness of your map. So it's only as you start getting to perhaps around five angstrom resolution that you might start seeing hints of something more. Um, and so here you can see perhaps maybe a bulky side chain coming off over here. And perhaps uh, in this helix here, you might, you might start to be able to convince yourself whether your map is right-handed or left-handed uh, in this area. But you might, you might not be super confident about it. Um, and of course, it'll depend on, on the kind of local quality of, of the map where you're looking. But as we move beyond, beyond about five angstroms um, and start getting into kind of the mid fours, then I think things fairly rapidly start becoming more clear. And so here you can see, um, we're definitely seeing more side chains sticking off. And, and the handedness of this helix, I think, starts becoming pretty well defined. And then of course, we can keep moving to, to higher and higher resolution. It starts getting very beautiful. So this is again, this LPS transporter structure that uh, was published recently from uh, Malfrum's lab. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, so the, the handedness of this helix is very clear, and we see, see more and more side chains. And then, of course, what we're always dreaming of is something maybe a bit more like three angstroms resolution, where you know, even when we contour the map down quite a ways, um, we, we can, you know, the map stays very tightly with the backbone here. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Oh, I'm seeing, okay, so now you can see a little more explicitly of just how nicely you can start to fit your model into this map. Okay, so we all dream for three angstroms resolution, um, but we can do a lot kind of in the intermediate regime up to about, say, uh, eight angstroms or so. So that's all alpha helices, right? So what do beta strands look like? So, so everyone wants their protein to be all alpha as much as possible because there, you know, at eight angstroms, you might be able to start placing, placing something. So at eight angstroms, beta sheets look pretty bad. Um, and so this is actually an x-ray map. I'm showing you kind of a mix of, of x-ray and EM maps. Um, but you can see that pretty much when you look at it on side, all you can really see is a slab of density. Um, and when it's rotated around, looking at it kind of face on, you, you, again, you just see this kind of flat, relatively featureless, often doesn't even really cover, cover the sheet entirely. So, so here's a kind of another example here um, at about six angstroms resolution. Um, and as we mess with the contour of the map, you can see as we contour down, you don't really, um, you don't really separate individual strands. And so if you are contouring down and thinking, oh, okay, that might be my strand, um, you'll actually end up probably building it in completely the wrong orientation. So still, still not many features around, around six angstroms resolution. Okay, um, as you start getting into the four to five angstroms resolution regime, then you may start to see something a little more interesting. So still not great here, uh, but you may be starting to see a little bit of separation separation of these strands. But it's really not until you get to kind of mid to low fours that, um, that you start to be able to see much of anything. And still at this resolution, I think I would be really hesitant to be trying to fit these individual strands in, right? I mean, we are starting to resolve them, but you could imagine very easily potentially kind of going diagonal through this region perhaps. Um, so it'll all really depend very much on what the, the density of your map looks like in, in the local region where you're building. But here you can imagine if you fit in a domain, you'd feel fairly confident that, that you've got your beta sheet in, in about the right location. Um, and then as we drop below four angstroms, these maps of course get to be really quite nice. Um, strands are very well separated. 
we have lots of side chains pushing um, out at the two faces of the sheet. I even see, like, say, a tryptophan residue kind of here, here in the back. Okay, so, so summing up what we get out of kind of looking through this series of maps, you can kind of get an overall picture of what you might expect for helices versus beta strands at a range of different resolutions. So in this kind of lowest resolution regime, more what Gira was just talking about, um, pretty much all secondary structure will largely be absent. So, so you may occasionally see the hint of a helix, but you're definitely not going to see anything very clear for, for beta strands. I mean, so we're really going to be stuck just fitting, fitting folded domains into the map. In this kind of eight, five to eight angstroms resolution regime, you'll probably see uh, alpha helices appealing, uh, appearing as kind of just cylinders. Um, you'll see density for sheets, but you'll, they'll probably be fairly poorly defined and not necessarily cover the sheet very well. Um, and then as we go to higher resolution in the kind of four to five angstroms range, we start, the helices start seeing, we start seeing some additional features. We may be able to, to determine the handedness of our map, whether the helices appear to be right-handed or left-handed. Um, and the, the strands of beta sheets might begin to separate. And it's really only when we get to this kind of four angstroms or better range that, that everything starts looking pretty clear and you potentially you know, would be able to build a, a nice model to know. But of course, I, I really do want to stress that this really depends on, on your particular data set and where you are on the map. Um, and four angstroms from one data set might look fairly different from four angstroms uh, from another data set. Uh, so just got to keep that. But these are kind of general guidelines. OK. But as you start getting into that kind of four to five angstroms resolution range, um, you potentially can assign the handedness of your map. Um, there are experimental ways you could do this at lower resolution as well, such as looking at tilt pairs. Um, but as you start getting to a resolution where you, you can see the handedness of the density for your alpha helices, you could, you could assign whether your map has right-handed alpha helices or left-handed alpha helices. And of course, we know that proteins have right-handed alpha helices. So potentially, the map you get out initially might have its handedness inverted, and you might have to flip this back and forth. Um, and so, so here's an example of a, we were building a pretty much all beta structure, but it had just one or two tiny little helical bits like this. And initially our map was backwards, actually, and I, I, I was trying to come up with a way that I could show this, but it's, it's kind of like very difficult to see, I think, without manipulating it yourself. But, um, but based upon this, you know, so we were at about four angstroms resolution, so we should be able to see the handedness of helices, but we didn't have very many. But fortunately, there were kind of one or two places where we could convince ourselves um, what the handedness of the map was, and we were able to invert it to actually um, make it the correct one. Okay, so um, the handedness of helices is one way you could assign the, the handedness of your map. Make sure you get it right. Um, a sort of lesser known way of doing this is looking at, at beta sheets. Um, and so beta sheets also have a handedness. So instead of having a right-handed kind of helical uh, being a right-handed helix like, like alpha helices, beta sheets actually have a kind of left-handed twist when you're looking at the level of the sheet. Um, so there's some other convention about um, beta sheets I don't want to go into that kind of gets confusing, but, but as, you, as you move from one strand to another across a long sheet like this, um, it will adopt a sort of left-handed helix. You can imagine if we're, if we're moving in this direction here, this, uh, this sheet kind of twists in this direction. So if you were at fairly high resolution, um, but only had beta strands in your structure, you could potentially use this to, to assign the handedness as well. Okay, so um, I want to just run through a kind of uh, a test case here, I guess, of a, a kind of four angstrom structure we did a few years ago of a protein called PQIB. This protein is involved in, in lipid transport in, in bacteria to move lipids back and forth between membranes. Um, and so this was, a, this was our initial, initial density map. Um, and so we had these kind of three layers of density very clearly here, forming a sort of barrel. And then we had this additional density going up, up to the top, something that we thought was flexible and sort of getting blurred out as we moved further and further away from the core. Um, when we color this map by local resolution, you can see that um, overall, you know, we're, we're largely in the kind of like four, four and a half angstroms resolution range, uh, with some areas going, going a good bit lower than that. Okay, so what did we know going into this? So we had some very useful prior knowledge in this case. So we'd previously um, solved a structure of um, 
of the domain that builds up this, this barrel that is the core of this, this protein PQID. And so we knew the structure of the fold, um, and we knew that that fold assembled into this quaternary structure, so six copies of that domain uh, assembled to form this hexameric ring. And so we could use this information to start trying to fit things into our map. So I said we had these kind of three layers of density that are making up this barrel region. And they looked very much like we probably had three of those hexameric rings that were all kind of stacked on top of each other here. And so, so we could fit in um, three copies of that ring. At this point, they're all identical to each other. Uh, kind of getting back to uh, your question earlier, I mean, the sequence identity between this model we're putting in and the target structure is probably only about 20%. So um, it's fairly divergent, but we were confident that it adopted the same, same fold. So, so we thought that by kind of fitting this in and getting it at least reasonably close, we'd be able to allow the secondary structure to relax into the new map um, and save us from tracing this, tracing this from scratch. Okay. So um, once we had this docked in, we could see plenty of places in the map where, um, where the map differed from, from the model we had put in or where we were seeing additional features coming up. Um, so looking at this region here that's kind of connecting one ring to the next ring above it, we could see what looked like could be potentially a, a bit of alpha helix. Um, and so indeed, we can, we can dock um, some sort of helical structure into that region and ultimately refines quite nicely here in the map. Um, similarly, here was, here was a loop that uh, in our starting structure projected kind of way out into solvent, um, but, but we could see a path uh, for the, w the way this loop probably should be built. And so we could kind of fiddle with that loop and, and build it in. And of course, we had to go through the whole sequence of the protein to, um, yeah, like magic, um, to, to, to you know, mutate all the side chains to match, match the new target structure. Um, but ultimately, after refinement, it looks pretty nice. Uh, but you'll encounter probably a lot of things you don't quite know what to do with. Um, and so this was sort of a surprise for us here. So, so kind of at the center of this barrel, um, we saw these, these kind of like vertical strips of density that um, if we look at, if we instead kind of cut the protein uh, in half through the middle of the barrel, so we're looking at a cross section, we can see that we actually have kind of 18 of these bits of density kind of all forming, uh, forming this kind of ring that potentially would line the central channel that we think would be kind of mediating the transport function of this protein. Um, and so in between each of these densities, we could, we could measure the approximate distance. Um, and so they were about five angstroms apart. And so that's very useful information in terms of figuring out what, what might fit in here. Um, and so, you know, could be alpha helices, could be beta strands. Um, you can look at sort of, again, prior knowledge about how close alpha helices potentially can come to each other. And so there's, there's a wide range depending upon their packing angles. But helices in general tend to have a sort of center of helix to center of helix distance of about 7 to 10 angstroms, maybe up to, to 12 angstroms. Whereas the spacing between adjacent beta strands and a beta sheet is much shorter, approximately 4.5 to, to 5 angstroms resolution. So based upon that, that spacing uh, in our density map, we can imagine that, okay, so, so at least some of these are probably, um, so we, you know, we had kind of two, two ends here in our model. I've forgotten about all this animation. Um, but so we can imagine fitting in kind of a, a beta hairpin that will account for, for some, of those, some of those densities. But there was this remaining bit that no matter what we did and no matter how we tried to, to thread our model through here, we always had, so of those 18 densities we saw, we could only account for 12 of them. And um, so there were six of these densities that um, looked to us very much like beta strands um, and, and kind of had the kind of pleated kind of shape of a beta strand, but we couldn't account for them at all. We don't know where they came from. Um, subsequently, we came to think that they're probably, we're probably actually seeing alternate conformations of this beta hairpin, which, which we weren't really expecting at this kind of four angstroms resolution. Um, but at the time, we didn't really know what to do with this. So, so this is a case where you can potentially just, you know, you, it's, it's nice to, to build it into your model so that you, uh, someone who downloads your PDB coordinate kno knows that you saw something there. Uh, but so we can call this a, a UNK, so an, an unknown ligand. Um, and that way it's kind of, it's documented and you, you've built in kind of your best guess as to, to what might be there. Okay, so do you want to take us through the take home messages? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think these kind of apply to whatever resolution you're at. Doesn't doesn't really matter.
out of it, at least in um, our experience, I think assessing the quality of a given area by really looking at the features of the, the area that you're building as opposed to what the reported resolution is or anything like this is kind of the most useful thing. If you, um, you know, you really want to build what you see and know more and uh, also not over interpreting the map I think is, is really important in the context of your biology. We want to make sure that whatever you build is correct and whatever you interpret really is correct and that means you usually have to have some kind of supporting data no matter what resolution that you're at. Um, I think being aware of also alternate interpretations of the map, like Damien just kind of walked you through that one uh, stray beta strand that we in subsequent higher resolution structures have found to be probably alternate confirmations um, is, is one example of this because at the time we certainly thought about alternate confirmations but we didn't feel like there was enough indication of this to really build it so I think kind of uh, really being aware of that. In the case of the lower resolution where we see that maybe domains could fit well equally well in you know five different orientations then I would, wouldn't really hazard a guess as to the orientation without doing um, other experiments are really maybe tagging either end of the domain to see where it ends up. Um, I think also deciding at what level your map allows you to reliably fit the model into it. So is it at the level of rigid body domains, in which case how will you define those domains? And that really depends on, I think, previous data and previous experiments. Um, it could be at the level of subdomains, like I showed you for the, the dynein molecule, where you could really break apart the domain into two and say, how do these move relative to each other? If you see clear secondary structure, then um, great, you can fit it a secondary structure. If you see amino acids, you can fit that. Maybe you then, um, in your next class, you'll see alternate rotor modes that you fit in and potentially waters and other ligands. Um, but I think really being aware and, and asking yourself, do I have this density? What, what can I reliably fit into it is the key thing. Um, and then really using all of available data. And at the end of the day, whatever resolution you're at, you kind of want to know whether this is consistent with uh, biochemical data, with functional data, with mass spec data, not just yours, but everyone else's in the field as well. Um, and I think this, uh, as we talked about in the beginning, if you're at super high resolution, you'll do maybe even unrestrained refinement someday in cryo EM structures. But, um, but even then, I think being aware of uh, understanding what that means in the context of biology is important. It, it'll, of course, be a correct structure at that point, but what it means for your particular biological question is, is a different matter, I think. So, um, yeah, so I think if we had one take-home message, it would be just built into whatever features that you actually can identify in the map. So, oh, and the one thing oh. we forgot to include on there is that probably your first structure should not be like a five angstrom structure and so you know we really suggest you know there's plenty of data out there that you can play with and so um, it's, it's definitely worth you know maybe building like a three angstrom two angstrom structure first so you, it, you get a sense of what proteins are supposed to look like before you start going to something very low resolution because especially you start getting into loops and these kind of less structured areas um, trying to build them in a confirmation that makes makes sense makes kind of structural sense I think it's kind of difficult until you have that that kind of experience so so definitely get some of those those uh, those beta galactosidase data sets build those first, first maybe and then before, before you do your your five angstrom structure mm -hmm. that's it so we're happy to discuss more is there any questions so you talked a little bit about what you can interpret you didn't tell about the time spent to interpret mm -hmm. and the frustration so you that might be sort of driven by your biology and the data that you have but do you have some pointers on cost-benefit analysis where if you're really stuck at seven or eight, how much do you want to spend on that versus do more biology? Hmm. That is a good question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I think yeah, I think at some point you have to decide what the like what your map tells you and doesn't tell you, and you have to make your peace with that. Um, we always hope that hope for a little more than we have probably. Um, so when you were all beta sheet, how hard? small bits of alpha, how, how hard was it to actually build and interpret? Well, so in that case, fortunately, I mean, so the main thing we had going for us was we at least had the domain 
we had the domains, we could fit into the map. One of the big challenges there, I think, was because the sequence identity was so low, um, and there was only one structure of that domain that had been solved previously, so we didn't have a whole lot, you know, in, in a case where, say, I was working on an antibody and there's a thousand antibody structures in the PDB, you could potentially superimpose multiple antibody structures and take advantage of that diversity of structural information to help your building. We spent a lot of time in that one trying to get the register right, because even though we had this one structure, mapping, um, mapping the sequence of this new protein that's only 20% identical onto that was quite challenging. But that we felt like we had to get right, you know, it's, um, and, and probably, probably it was going to be difficult to do some other experiment that was going to help us to really assign that register. So in a case like that, that's probably where, where I spent most of my time. But um, I don't know, like yeah, dynance may be a case yeah. where you... Yeah, that's kind of what you were saying, seven to nine or something. In that case, it gave us a lot of information. and. And time-wise, I can tell you, um, a lot of the original work was done during my postdoc and in the first version of Rely On and stuff. And this took me, you know, a long time. Probably uh, it took me like a few months to figure out. But now, in our own lab, it takes uh, Nicola about a week to do the <laughs> same the same thing for each one. So I think, you know, I, I wonder what I spent my time doing during <laughs> postdoc. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's awesome. But I think that that for that case. Um, that resolution was perfectly fine to for us to make some meaningful conclusion out of it, and I wouldn't I wouldn't actually spend that much more time trying to get higher resolution. But I think some of it comes mm -hmm. with knowing your molecule well enough. And the reason I wouldn't do it is because I think it would probably take us a year to make it much better. Um, I think that other groups have now maybe with improved sample preparation actually got it much better, and I think we should see that coming out pretty shortly, but, um, and it did take, you know, doing special sample preparation that really depends what your question is. What do you commonly use for anchors? I mean, sort of domains are good, folds are good. Do you, what orthogonal techniques have you also used to try to get register or, or to really place things well? Um, I mean, I use secondary structure prediction a lot because, you know, that can give you some sense of, of course, like the, if you're not dealing with something that's say like all alpha or all beta, um, you know, by knowing that you have say two beta strands followed by a helix, um, that can help you help to place you a bit in in the map somewhere. Um, I also, you know, so in this in this all, all beta protein, I mean, I also relied pretty heavily on on some kind of prior knowledge we didn't really talk about, but more on the sense of, you know, so you know that hydrophobic residues are going to be facing into the protein core, whereas hydrophilic residues are going to be facing outwards. So even if you don't have a whole lot of side chain density, so you at least know, you know, as you look at your sequence and you see kind of say an alternating hydrophobic hydrophilic pattern, okay, so you know which one should be facing inwards, which one should be facing outwards. Um, and sometimes that can help. So maybe you have, say, like one bulky hydrophobic in this region of density that you guess must be either a phenylalanine or a tryptophan. And you know, you know, if you have some ballpark idea of where you are in the sequence based upon the domain you've docked in and your sequence alignment, maybe that's good enough to kind of to anchor your register. But there are definitely some cases where it seems like it's just alternating between threonines and betalines all the way across the strand, and it's kind of hard to decide exactly where these things start on kind of a process of elimination. And maybe just to add to that, like before the model building, I think like putting a reasonable amount of effort into the refinement of the classification schemes and focus classification um, can really help. Because even, and we, we didn't talk about that, I guess, at all, but um, really making sure that you've done as much sequence fraction as you possibly could to get each piece of your map at the highest resolution possible, I think helps a lot. You can go from being pretty bulky beta strands to actually, you can clearly identify and possibly see a couple of side chains, and that will make it much better. So we usually do spend quite a bit of time uh, prior to the model building on actually making sure we have the best possible maps, and maybe like 15 maps for one protein, but you really want each area to be as good as possible.
So when's Easter on Monday? No, there's no more. There is no more. <laughs> no more trick oh, oh, that's okay. it. Just, just let's from here forward. Yes. So, okay. so all these next week, mm -hmm. and then now let's see what happens when you get higher and higher resolution. Mm -hmm. That's its own challenge. Yes, gotta build alternate everything. Everything. <laughs>